Today, we are leaving the mythology behind, although I'm still waiting on somebody to give me an interpretation of the Ursa story, so please keep thinking about that. But we'll be done with mythology for a little while, and we're going to move into the actual nitty gritties of big problems like gravitation and the orbital dynamics of planets, which are problems that still plague us to this day. Uh, just to give you a quick overview, we're going to start by talking about how folks first came to measure the Earth, which leads nicely into a story of how people came to understand where the Earth was in the context of all of the other planets. So we'll talk about the laws of planetary motion and more of that with Newton. And eventually we're going to wrap up with how we came to discover planets that weren't even there due to these revelations. But I want to I wanna start off with a story that I think is one of the best stories in perhaps all of mathematical science, you know. <clears throat> I spent a good deal of time kicking at math in the first couple of lectures because I think it's often confused for explanations, and I think this is a bit of a tragedy. Now, math is incredibly powerful, and sometimes it does lead you to discover things that you suspected to be true, but you weren't sure about. And so, you know, there was a, there was a real insistence in, in many cultures that the Earth was flat. And of course, on the corners of the internet, people still argue about this. But there's a really easy way to, to tell if it is or isn't, right? And it has to do with shadows. So, if the, uh, if the Earth was flat, let's just draw this out, and this is the sun, you should expect that no matter where you go on the Earth, if you have a stick, that these two sticks are going to cast the exact same shadows at the same time. And very quickly, people realized that this wasn't the case. So this gentleman, Aristophanes, was a Greek scholar working in Egypt in the early first millennium BC. And he realized that uh, through correspondence that at various times of day that the shadows being cast in these two towns, which were quite a bit away from one another in Egypt, were not occurring at the same time. So there was a well in this town. Uh, I believe it was called, let's see here, I believe it was called Serene. This was uh, Alexandria. And there was a well, and when the sun was directly overhead of the well, cast light down to the bottom. You could see the bottom. But at the same time of day, over in Alexandria, there was a shadow being cast. And so Aristophanes realized that this was pretty much a dead end for the flat Earth model. Now, all of this rests on the assumption that the sun is so very far away that all of its rays are essentially hitting the Earth parallel, which is quite a leap of faith. And in fact, people had a really hard time with that because for most of human history, people believe the sun was quite near. I mean, it's very bright and big. But Aristophanes insisted that the sun's rays were essentially parallel by the time they reached the, uh, the Earth. And here we have something of a figure to illustrate that from your textbook. But the idea is, you know, as you elongate an angle and it, it becomes closer and closer, the further it goes, these rays essentially appear parallel. So here was Aristophanes' experiment. He took advantage of this really simple geometric principle, which you probably learned, you know, maybe eighth grade, that these opposite interior angles are always equal. And so at the moment that there was no shadow down here, make sure I get the name of this, this town, Sain. Sain, am I saying that right? Who knows? The moment there was no shadow in Sain, over in Alexandria, he had somebody else measure it. And they had, you know, primitive clocks that were 
quite decent. I'm sure they had hourglasses or something like that. They could set them to be equal to one another. And they, they measured the length of this shadow over here, and they measured the angle here. Actually, they don't even need the length of the shadow. They measured the angle at the moment that the shadow was cast. At the moment, there was no shadow over in Sain. And what this did was it allowed them to understand the angle at the center of the Earth as well, which is pretty cool. It's a simple trick. Once you know the angle at the center of the Earth, which turned out to be 7 degrees, all of a sudden you know if this is 7 degrees and this is 360 degrees, then 7 degrees is a 50th of the entire circumference angularly. So if you know the distance between these two towns, you just have to multiply it by 50, and all of a sudden you know the circumference of the Earth. This is pretty crazy for such a simple idea. And it turns out he was basically right. He basically nailed it on the head. So there's some argument because they didn't have miles or kilometers back then. They had these things called stadia. You know, and the length of a, a stadia, stadium was, uh, is a matter of, of debate still to this day. So by various estimates, he was within a few percent of the, of the correct answer. And this is just a real triumph of reason, because this was the first time that anybody was able to make an actual convincing argument. And I think, I think this is really, really the value of mathematics in science and in astronomy in particular, is that mathematics allows you to lay out your ideas in an unambiguous way. Right? You might be wrong about your assumptions. You know, Say that he was uh, completely wrong about the parallel uh, rays, then the whole calculation would have been incorrect. But if you accept the assumptions, then you can lay your ideas out in a way that anybody can come along and look at them very quickly and, and decide whether they agree or not. And it turns out everybody agreed. So this was quite revolutionary. And that's not going to be the case with some of the other stories we're going to get into. All right, I'm going to turn down this light a little bit. Oops. All right. Now, the Greeks continued, however, to insist that the Earth was at the center of the universe. And of, of course, why shouldn't it be? It seems to be. When we look out at the sky, everything does seem to be going around us. And you know, this same concept here was part of their justification. See, they reasoned that if the Earth was going around the sun, then at different times of the year, you should have a slightly different view of the stars, right? So if you hold your finger out in front of you, and you close one eye, and then you close the other eye, it moves ever so slightly, right? This is kind of weird. I don't know if you ever thought about it. It's called parallax. So when, you're, when you're, your eye is on one side of your head, let's say that's observation in the spring, and then the other eye, I say your left eye, is the fall. You're going to see different pictures of the stars, right? Now, this turns out to be more exaggerated if you bring your finger closer to your face, right? You can really see it. The further you put it away from you, the less the parallax becomes. And so the problem for the Greeks was that the stars are just so freaking far away. They're unimaginably far away. And the parallax is impossible to measure without a modern telescope. So they were absolutely convinced that since, hey, there's, uh, we can't see this parallax, so therefore, we are at the center of everything. It's not unreasonable. What's up? Yeah, yeah. So, so parallax is how the angle of your observation, depending on where you're at, changes the apparent position of things that are far away. Or not even far away. So if you take your finger, right, and you close one eye, and then switch and close the other eye, your finger appears to move. It's very, it's very strange. This matters a lot if you do any kind of archery or shooting sports. Uh, I don't know if it matters for throwing. Does anybody, does anybody play football? Baseball? You close one of your eyes when you play baseball or football? Yeah. In rugby? Right on. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so so this, prince, this had basically convinced the Greeks that they, they knew everything and they were you know, it looks, everything seems to be going around us. We can't see any parallax, and so 
It must be so. Now, there were arguments against that, though, OK? So Aristotle, you know, you've probably heard a lot about Aristotle. If you haven't, you will, because Aristotle is beloved in the academy to this day. But Aristotle, this was his principal argument, was this parallax argument. Now, other people said things like, hey, what about the phases of the moon? Seems, uh, it seems like there's a round shadow on this thing, right? But they were laughed off, you know, this is, where's the parallax? And then navigators would come back from the sea and they would say, hey, if the earth is flat, why is it that the stars, why is it that when I go south, I see a different set of stars than when I go to the north? If the earth was, if the earth was flat, if the earth was at the center of the universe, this shouldn't be the case. But so it was. Now, there was another Greek, Aristarchus of Samos, who had a different idea. And his idea was that perhaps the sun was actually at the center of the universe, which also turns out to be completely false, but it's closer to the right idea. And this gentleman's writings did not survive to this day, but he's written about by other scholars, and so we, we know that he thought of it. And we're going to talk about Copernicus, who, who was the one who gets all the credit for this later. But this idea was also uh, championed by scholars in Islam uh, long before Copernicus also, uh, several of them. In fact, it was, uh, it was more or less well understood that bodies traveled around the sun. Now, they didn't have the exact mathematics of that worked out, and they hadn't really detailed it in the same way that Copernicus did. We'll get to Copernicus in a second. But this was the guy who first proposed it, as far as I can tell, at least in the history, as far as we have records of it. And I can't read uh, Chinese or, or Indian, so I'm not sure if there's any scholarship in, in that dimension. But it hasn't been translated to English, as far as I can tell. And there he is. Now, there was another very, very popular scholar who was uh, also Greek. Now, Greek. Greek had dominion over Egypt by this point, too, right? This is hard for people to understand. Why are all these Greek scholars, what are they doing in Egypt? Well, they had taken control of it by that point. And Ptolemy was one of these folks. And, and Ptolemy was greatly respected because he had assembled one of the greatest star catalogs of all time, just thousands of stars and their, their positions over many decades. He did a lot of other cool stuff, too. Uh, Everybody back then seemed to have been a little bit of a polymath. But Ptolemy insisted that we could explain some of the aberrations that we see if we just modified the orbital dynamics a little bit. And so we talked a bit about this in the first class. But if you ever pay attention to uh, the sky over the seasons, and, and of course, maybe you've heard of this in astrology, there's this concept of retrograde motion, right? When you, when you watch, when you watch a, a planet, especially some of the brighter ones, like let's say some of the nearer ones like Mars, or maybe one of the, the more far out ones like Jupiter, there's going to become a point at which the planet in the sky, it's, it's tracking across the, the night sky. At some point in, in the year, it will appear to move backwards. This is, of course, really troubling and one of the principal arguments against the sun being at the center of the world, the universe. And it turns out that you can, of course, explain this away very nicely. And the way that you do that is you build a series of, of perfect circles. And they have different pivot points. And you add an extra circle. And if there's any disagreement between your predicted motions, you just add another circle. You know, the Greeks, especially after Pythagoras were obsessed with circles, right? The circle is quite incredible. Obviously, we just saw how a circle allowed us to calculate the size of the Earth, which is rather incredible. So the circle is at the center of so many magic tricks, it's just unimaginable. And, and everyone was convinced, you know, why would the gods make the planets orbit in anything other than a circle, right? But it didn't quite work out. So they kept tacking on these things called epicycles. 
And so we'll keep revisiting the concept of ep epicycles because this happens to this day and to some extent. And there's, there's more history of, of epicycles being put into these theories in order to save them. Because physics is obsessed with beauty and simplicity. And why shouldn't it be? That's, that'd be wonderful if we could simplify everything down, right? If we had a, 20 equations, we could simplify them to four, like uh, Heavisides did with Maxwell's equations. That would be fantastic. But it doesn't mean that it's right is the problem. Just because it's beautiful, just because it's simple, nature is sometimes messy. And actually, it turns out, and of course, in this case, nature is a bit messy. So this is what the orbit would look like with the uh, let's say, of uh, Mars, if, the, if we were to add those epicycles into it. And, uh, and people argued that this was much more beautiful, and, you know, and they could use perfect circles for it. This, on the other hand, the one that we have today, we'll, we're going to check out in a moment, it's not actually circles, right? These are ellipses, and we'll talk about what an ellipse is. But they're imperfect circles, and this drove people mad. They couldn't believe it. How could, how could nature do this to us, right? Yes? No, it misses it very, very slightly. That's, oh, yeah, this is the sun, yeah. Oh, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yes, so the Earth is at the center of the universe, right? Nothing ever touches it. Very convenient. But... It's not unreasonable, right? These, these, these weren't just like some barbarian, superstitious idiots. They were, they were working very hard at this, and this was the best thing they could come up with. And it's very hard to see ourselves today as the same sort of people who are prone to making mistakes and who people a thousand years from now will be sitting in a classroom like this and being like, oh my God, right? I mean, I think about it all the time when I read these headlines. I think anytime you see something like, in, in astrophysics or cosmology, where they have the adjective dark in front of it, or black or something, it's like, we don't know what's happening. We just don't know. That's OK, though. That's, that's the road to finding out. And we'll figure it out. So oh, I wanted to actually uh, prop up Ptolemy. He, he did do some cool stuff also, besides, you know, he was completely wrong, of course. And he was loud and wrong, by the way. He controlled the academy at the time. And so that geocentric model held sway for a thousand years in the West, right? This guy was like Neil deGrasse Tyson, like he was like huge, and he was like, we are not entertaining anything else. And so it was. But he did make some of the most uh, amazing maps. He was a cartographer also. And so if you check out this map, this is a reproduction based on uh, some sketches and, and earlier descriptions, but it's pretty, it's pretty darn close, you know, at least uh, with respect to the region that they were able to describe at the time. So Ptolemy, not completely uh, worthless. Um, a very, very prestigious, but very doggedly wrong about this matter. And I think there's a lesson in there, and we'll keep coming back to it. You know, there's a real lesson that we have to, we have, to have humility in science. You know, no matter, no matter how many, uh, you know, no matter how many Nobel Prizes or how prestigious somebody is, they can be wrong. This guy's fame was unimaginable, okay? And he, he was completely wrong. So that's very important to remember. When I was in college, I had this impression when I was going through, you know, physics and so forth that basically we figured everything out. I was like, eh, I don't know if I want to go study this stuff. It seems like it's all wrapped up pretty much, right? Remember, we're always learning new ways to describe nature, and we're always getting better at it. OK, let's move on. Let's talk about this gentleman, Copernicus. OK, so Copernicus, and I, I want to talk about Copernicus. I know this, this, this is a very uh, beat story. Copernicus and Galileo, right? These are two people who both championed this model. And this is from uh, Copernicus's book. There's these two characters, and they're very different. And I think that their differences can teach us a lot about how to go about changing a paradigm, right? Because it's not easy to convince somebody like Ptolemy or Neil deGrasse Tyson that their, their idea of how the universe works is fatally flawed. That's a very difficult thing to achieve, right? 
So the interesting thing about Copernicus was that I don't I think that he inherited the idea from from the ancient Greeks, right? We talked about uh, uh, we talked about how there were various people in Islam in Greece who had pointed out that the sun was probably at the center of the solar system. And I think this was something of a fringe idea in his time, right? Now, Copernicus was in the unique position that he was born into a wealthy family. He was literate, <clears throat> he was well-connected, and he was mathematically adept. So he had all the tools necessary to bring about a paradigm shift, but he was very afraid because this was tantamount to career suicide, right? You don't just get up on a podium and, and when you're, you're an established professional, you know, working in these venerated institutions and start saying that the authorities of the day have no idea how the solar system works. You just don't do that, right? So what did he do? He worked on this book his entire life. He had jobs in the government. He, he worked as a physician for some time. He did some tutoring. But he wrote this book, and he shared it with his friends, and he shared it secretly with everybody he could who, so he could get feedback on it, right? And the printing press was coming online during his lifetime. He was in the German area. It was called Prussia back then. And on the day that he died, his book was printed. He waited his entire life to do this, right? On the other hand, there's this other gentleman, Galileo. Let's talk about him for a second. Now, Galileo, I have lots of good things to say about him, and we'll get to that in a moment, especially with regards to his technological achievements. But Galileo thought that Copernicus' idea, he lived a little bit after Copernicus. Maybe he was a generation after. And after Copernicus's book was published, it was making its way around, and people were kind of, you know, there was a little bit of a buzz, like, what's this all about? This is bizarre, you know? It's hard to actually, I'm going to take an aside real quick. It's hard to actually conceive of how important the printing press was. You know, you guys are all born into the internet world, right? For the most part, there's a few faces maybe that, that didn't experience the internet as a kid. I, I didn't have the internet for a little bit when I was a kid. The printing press was kind of like that. It changed everything, right? All of a sudden, normal people could get a hold of these texts in their, in their normal native language, right? Everything used to be written in Latin. I mean, good luck finding a book before the invention of the printing press. It'd have to be written by a monk over a lifetime in some monastery, right? They'd be priceless artifacts. So Galileo had read Copernicus's work, and he was convinced. But unlike Copernicus, Galileo was a little bit more of a fighter, right? And of course, in that day, there was no real distinction between the church and the state. This is a really fascinating situation. So, and today, I would say there's not too much of a distinction between the state and the academic science, which is really fascinating. Because the science that we teach in the academy here is the same science that the state uses for all of its technological developments. It's warfare, it's space exploration, right? Those are sort of the same thing. But in this day, it was actually the church and the state, right? There was kings and so forth, but they all bowed down to the church. Well, Galileo was perfectly happy to go and tango with the church, the authorities, right? Unlike Copernicus, by the way, I didn't even mention this, Copernicus dedicated his book to the pope, actually. How about that? And he didn't publish it until he died. He was that afraid, right? But I don't know if he was afraid of persecution so much as he wanted it to be well received. And this is a, a real challenge, you know? If, anybody, if any of you have ever had a really cool idea and then you, you rush out into the world to tell people about it, you'll be very quickly uh, astonished by how little anyone cares, no matter how good the idea is. That's, that's such a small part of changing the world, is having a good idea. I mean, 
certainly have good ideas, but to get it out there, right? To, to actually change people's minds is, is not easy. So what did Galileo do? He, he wrote a book. Uh, it was called A Dialogue Between Two Chief World Systems. And Galileo made one of the central characters in his book modeled after the Pope, and he, he named him Sim, Simplicus, right? Which is something like an insult at the time, although it's actually a reference to a, a famous uh, philosopher. Uh, so he said, but the Pope didn't take it that way. And the Pope was, uh, was very unhappy, not only because the dialogue leaned towards the Copernican system, but also because it sort of made fun of the Pope and made him seem like a moron. So what happened to Galileo? Yeah, essentially, they said, you, you can't leave your house for the rest of your life. How about that? And you're not going to write, and your book's not going to be published, and nothing good's going to happen. That's what Copernicus was afraid of, I think. Yeah? So he was in the same dungeon as the Virgin Maiden. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> except they fed him. They kept him alive. Yeah, the Virgin Maidens, they just got, they sealed up the wall and let him die in there. Different times. So, but were they really different times? Honestly, if you, let's, you know, let's say that you have a new idea about how the solar system is organized. And all of the mathematical models that we have today work perfectly well as they, they did back then. How easy do you think it would be for you to promote that idea? It would be very, very tricky. What's up? Oh, this was a very common punishment, actually, and especially all the way up into medieval times, right? You know, they can, you can go to these places in Europe, and you can, you can find they've, they've, they're still finding inside of the walls of these castles places where people had been sealed up in there, you know? I'm, I'm sure they were greatly superstitious. Yeah, but that, you know, but again, like, it seems superstitious in hindsight, right? You know, maybe dark matter will seem superstitious a thousand years from now. Maybe it'll seem superstitious a year from now. Like, this is how we progress to understanding. I think it's important to go through those phases. Um, you know, when you're, when you're first born, you, you know nothing. Everything is superstitious to you. There's just this, this thing taking care of you, feeding you. You just scream and it gives you some food. It's like, what's happening, right? I mean, the whole, nothing makes sense until you, you give it that meaning. And it's been a long process of learning those things. And we're still going. So Galileo and Copernicus, two ways to try to change a paradigm, right? And of course, you know, it, it eventually worked out for both of them to some extent. Neither one of them lived to see their ideas being well received. But I think that the lesson here is if you, if you really want to change the minds or the hearts of people, you need to go about it very carefully, right? You need to think about who those authority structures are. You need to think about how you're going to soothe them, right? So uh, my wife and I run a podcast, and we like to call up, uh, we call different you know, scientists from around the world. We also call weirdos who have weird scientific theories, and we talk to them too, right? And, uh, you know, there's two types of weirdos who have scientific theories, right? There's the Galilean type and the Copernican type, right? There's, and most of them are the Galilean type. They think everybody else except for them is a moron. And that if everybody would just stop being stupid, that people would see the light in their theory. And it's, it's, a, it's a very passionate issue for me because I see that amongst all of these lunatics, there's some really good ideas out there. Now, almost never are the ideas good in their, in their present form, but there's little crumbs of them that are good. And I think that it's essential that we understand that in order to actually develop new ideas, right, as opposed to just working on something that's already there, like building more epicycles onto a theory. If we actually want to develop something new, we need to learn how to interact in a social setting. That's what this is. This is social politics, right? And who would have thought that would matter in science? Well, it matters a lot, as it turns out. Right? Nobody exists in a vacuum. You can write up the best idea in the world, and no one's going to read it if you can't get along with people. 
And maybe that means the Pope, which is troubling, but it is so, and it's worth considering. So that's a great story. Now, Galileo gave us the telescope in its, in its more or less contemporary form, and he was able to observe all sorts of things we hadn't seen before, including the moons of Jupiter, which I hope many of you got to see this week. Uh, and in particular, the phases of Venus. Oh, we should mention, that in case I forget to come back to it later, that Galileo also recognized that acceleration is constant, which will matter when we get to Newton in a little bit. But he did a lot of really cool stuff, actually. It's hard to even say all the cool stuff that Galileo did, but he was, he was a, a little bit of a, you know, he was a lunatic a little bit. Let's put it that way. He was in the face of authority all the time. So with his telescope, there it is, he was able to see this for the first time, which, are, which was something that had been discussed as soon as Copernicus's work came out, that, hey, if this is the case, we should be able to see phases on Venus just like we see phases on the moon. And with Galileo's telescope, it became apparent that, yeah, yeah, Venus did have these phases, and this model was becoming increasingly difficult to ignore. And in fact, eventually the church apologized and said, yeah, you know, it's, it's all right. But they found their way around it. They adjusted the theology a little bit, tacked on their own epicycles. <clears throat> it wasn't for a mm, couple more hundred years into the 1600s uh, that folks actually started to think about what, what could possibly, I don't want to say cause, but they, they would certainly were curious about what caused these orbital, orbital dynamics. And the first step to figuring out what causes something is often making a model of it so you can look at it from all angles and tear it apart. And sometimes that's a mathematical model. <clears throat> and so these two gentlemen come into the picture and uh, they won, let's see here, make sure I say this properly from your perspective. So over here we have Tycho, and over, over here we have Kepler. And, Tychler and Kepler, Tech, Tycho and Kepler couldn't have been more different people if they tried, which is quite fascinating. Kepler came from modest means. He, he, he was more or less an orphan. He didn't have much of a, a family to turn back to. Passed around uh, amongst his extended family and eventually found some work as a tutor. And he would go from town to town and, and tutor uh, rich kids, basically. <clears throat> Tycho, on the other hand, complete playboy. You can see he's chilling in his palace over here. He's got, uh, he's got all the food and drink imaginable. And, but he does have one very useful hobby, which is that he, he likes to track the stars with his Galilean telescope. Now, he was renowned for having one of the best star catalogs in the world at that time. Right? He was, was sort of sort of his point of pride of his hobby. And Kepler knew about it. And Kepler was a mathematician more than anything. And so Kepler went to see Tycho. <clears throat> and he was very disappointed, right? Because Kepler was very, you know, think about your, your classic nerd, right? He's, he's really, really interested in these technical details. He believes in his work. He thinks it's sublime and transcendent. And it's the most important thing in the world. And he goes to visit this man who has all of the data. And the guy's a complete lush, right? He's just wasted in, until the wee hours of the morning every night. And, and uh, Kepler can hardly even get a word in to speak to him about anything. But, you know, eventually, Kepler is able to get a hold of the data. And Kepler makes sense of it. And, uh, oh, totally off topic, but probably worth pointing out that Tycho got in a duel with somebody over a mathematical quarrel when he was young, and the guy sliced his nose off. So he had a golden nose that he would wear around everywhere. I mean, this guy was just a complete character. I was thinking about dressing up like him for Halloween this year. All right, so Kepler, uh, Kepler was, everybody was dealing with this problem, right? The, the perfect circles didn't seem to be working out. You know, Copernicus's idea was cool. It made sense. We'd seen the phases of Venus, but we can't 
fit these planets onto circular orbits. They're, they're a little bit wrong, right? And Kepler, uh, ever the geometrician and the mathematician, had this idea that, hey, what if it's not a perfect circle? What if it's an imperfect circle? What if it's an ellipse, right? And ellipses can be generated by taking a slice of a, of a column. And this turned out to work perfectly. So let's talk a little bit about what an ellipse is and the terminology we'll need for that. There's this concept of the major and semi-major axis. This is essentially just the widest part of the ellipse. And the semi-major being the distance from the center to the widest part. Now what's really funny to me is that your textbook insists, hey, for orbits, the semi-major axis, which is A in this, in this drawing, is essentially equal to the average distance of the planet from the sun. And I'm like, that's freaking crazy. Like, that's just a circular orbit. That's like saying there's no, there's no ellipse at all. And it turns out that it works more or less, right? You can have the average distance be your semi-major axis in so much as there isn't much eccentricity to the ellipse. So what does eccentricity mean? This means how not circular the thing is, how flattened your circle is. And it turns out that almost all of the interior planets have very little eccentricity to them. And so, let's see here. As the planets orbit, they are going to be, well, we don't even need this figure. Let's go on and look at eccentricities. So here's all the eccentricities for all of our favorite planets. It's a number between zero and one. So something that has an eccentricity of zero is a perfect circle. Something that has something, uh, an eccentricity of one would be a line, actually, it'd be so flat. But as you can see, the planets, for the most part, are very close to zero. And so we can say that the semi-major axis is, in fact, somewhat close to the radius of the orbit, which means it's essentially the average distance from the sun at any given point in time. But what do you, you notice these, these very elliptical ones over there. What do you figure those are? Is that somebody else? Okay, right. they're comets, right? <clears throat> what do you figure the eccentricities on those comets are? Numbers, anybody? Throw them out there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's about right. So that, uh, I don't know how to say this, Kopf is 0.5481 and Inke is 0.8471. That's a seriously elliptical orbit. Okay. What's that? Haley is a comet. Oh, what is it? What is it? That's a good question. It looks like somewhere a bit lower, maybe 0.3 or so. I don't know. I didn't write that one down. So, Kepler, Kepler realized this, and Kepler began to try to improve upon his model, right? Again, the point of a model, whether it's mathematical or a physical model, is so you can see more angles on it, right? And so Kepler began looking for ways to describe the paths of these bodies as they orbit. And one thing he noticed, I'm sure that others had noticed this as well, was that the planets, when they were closest to the sun, seemed to go fastest. And when they, were, uh, when they were distant, they went slower. And it turns out that this makes a lot of sense because you have this slingshot effect where it's being pulled towards the sun and then whoosh, as it gets further, the, the gravity is less and it's pulled slower and then it's, it repeats, right? And Kepler had the uh, mathematical wherewithal to figure out a way to explain this in a very simple mathematical statement. And so, before, actually before I even get into any of the mathematics, <clears throat> this is obviously not a mathematical course, not really gonna be tested on the mathematics or anything, but I think that it's worth understanding that these simple models do lead us to making physical revelations now and, and then. And it's important to understand where we're at today and so 
that's why we're, I'm going to talk about a few choice pieces of mathematics, including Kepler's laws and Newton as well. And let's get into that. So Kepler realized that he could describe the period of this orbit with respect to the semi-major axis in this very simple fashion where the period squared is proportional. This is one of my favorite signs in all of mathematics, the proportional sign. And it's proportional to the semi-major axis cubed. And so why is this a fantastic uh, uh, a sign in mathematics? Because it allows you to make a generalized statement, right? The orbits are all a little bit different. That is to say that if we put, we have to actually to put an equal sign there, we'd have to put some sort of number in front of one of those variables. Yes? Oh, we'll get there. Don't worry. Yeah. Oh, 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 the other ones just had to do with the uh, elliptical orbits and so forth. There, yeah, you can follow up. They're all in your textbook. So, right, so Kepler realized there was a proportionality to this. He didn't know what that scaling factor was. And so, if you are ever looking at a set of data, maybe some of you will go to grad school and, and, and actually do scientific experiments yourself. The first thing you're going to look for is congruences between, and patterns between different sets of data. And you're going to find some of those, right? Like, let's say a hurricane looks a little bit like a galaxy. What's up with that? Well, it's not exactly like a galaxy. It looks a little bit like it. And maybe you're able to find some, some, some pattern that can teach you something about the motion of those bodies. But there's going to be a scaling factor, right? Because the galaxy is obviously much bigger. Let's say it's moving much faster. Each one of those variables might have a scaling factor. That's going to prove really important because Newton gives us the concept of mass as a result of this. It turns out that that scaling factor is actually the masses of the bodies that are involved. Kepler didn't realize that, and that's totally fine. So he put this wonderful little proportionality symbol in there for the, as a placeholder. He said, I don't know what it is. Somebody else will figure it out. Fair enough. So before we get into Newton, we got to talk about some Newtonian keywords, let's say. Uh, there's a number of terms that we have to understand. We're going to keep using them as we go throughout this course. So these are really, really, you might think you know what these mean, too. They're, they're ones that people throw around in common parlance all the time. But they turn out to be really complex concepts that we still don't have a grasp on. And that's really important. But Newton brought them to our attention. Uh, others had played with them, but Newton gave them a word. He coined these terms. By the way, I highly recommend coining terms if you're ever in the position to do it. So see if you can get new words to stick in the language. All right, so inertia, what is that? Inertia is a really strange concept. It just means that things like to stay the course. If they're sitting still, they want to stay sitting still. If they're moving, they want to stay moving. This is a very, very difficult concept to explain to this day. And so I talked a little bit about Mach last time. Uh, who you know from like different speeds of sound, probably. Or maybe, yeah, that's probably the best place you know him from. So, to my knowledge, Mach is the only person who's even attempted to make sense of inertia. Because it's a very strange thing, right? Why do things, like on Earth, it makes a lot of sense that, okay, my, uh, you know, I set my cup down, it's going to stay there because of gravity. Fair enough. But, what about in space, right? We go to space in the modern era, and things also want to stay still, right? This is very strange. You can watch these astronauts working on the space station. And if they're dealing with something heavy, it's actually very hard to stop it, if you're, especially if you're not holding on to something, right? So inertia, inertia plays out regardless of the immediate gravitational system. And why is that? It's crazy. Yeah, and that's Mach's idea. Actually, Einstein got that from Mach. It's called Mach's principle, right? And the idea is that the, the rest of the universe matters. Even if you're not next to Earth, right, that's holding on to you, the whole of the rest of the stars and everything else, even though they're very far away and gravity is very, very weak, something like tens of powers less 
strong than electromagnetism. It's very weak, but all of it added together matters, right? The rest of the universe really holds on to everything. And that's something we're thinking about, you know? Why does it hold on to everything? What is, you know, you mentioned general relativity. We'll get into that plenty later. General relativity is a fantastic mathematical model. It's very precise for what's happening, but it doesn't tell us why it's happening, right? And we'll, we'll, we'll unpack that later because that's a bold statement. But what is holding everything to, uh, holding everything to one another? This is, this is a problem we, I, I would submit to you that we haven't solved yet and we will eventually. But how are these atoms connected to one another? And I think connection is really what's, what needs to be thought about. How are they connected to one another? But inertia has to do with the fact that the whole of the universe is holding everything in place. And it's very difficult to move things as a result of it. Obviously, on Earth, it's very difficult to move things as well because of gravity, local gravity. OK, so we have inertia. Uh, two more of these concepts kind of go with it. And that's momentum, which is how much stuff is moving. right? And momentum, actually, in Newton's day, momentum wasn't a, a concept distinguished from energy. And I would say to you that as we move through this course, energy should also be thought of very similarly. It's something moving, right? It's some, or if it's potential energy, it's the, the, the potential for something to be moving, right? And this has gotten lost, uh, especially when we get down at the very small levels or at the astronomical levels. We always have to be talking about something moving or with the potential to be moving. And so momentum was Newton's concept for that. We still use it quite a bit today. And then the force, right? This is, this is of course, maybe Newton's uh, crowning achievement is, is the idea of the force, right? Which is a super mystical and, and supernatural sounding thing, right? And I'm sure people will make fun of us in a thousand years for this. Yeah, Star Wars, right? What's well, a force, right? I mean, and it gets out of control. People, are, are, people will often explain things in terms of the force is doing this, the force is doing that. I, I, uh, I take issue with those sort of explanations because they don't get down to the bottom of the story. And the bottom of the story in physics is always that something right, is doing something. Some material actor is doing something. This is what physics means, ultimately. But Newton basically said, hey, I'm going to call a push or a pull a force. And uh, that worked out really well. It simplified things. And uh, we did, it, it allowed him to develop the laws that we're going to talk about. And also, it allowed us to develop the uh, general relativity. And I don't know if we'll get into that today, but we might. Because it comes directly from Mach and Newton's concept of a force. And this, ah, let's just do it. All right, so look, the, a force, right? Well, we'll get to Newton's first law, and let's do that first. OK, make sure that we got the terms out of the way. So Newton's first law is that if something is at rest, that it's basically going to stay at, at rest. This is his inertia idea. So this first law is, is just inertia, OK? No big deal. The second law is that when, when a force is applied, when it's pushed or pulled, that rate of change in momentum equals the force of the push or pull. You probably know this one as F equals MA, right? And uh, the third law is that uh, for every action, there's an equal and opposite uh, reaction. And so there's a mathematical way of phrasing all of those, by the way. Um, the first one, maybe not so much. Uh, the second one, we can simply say that uh, the change in momentum with time. How many of you had taken calculus before? Half, maybe? OK, so this is, just some, this is about as much calculus as we'll ever do in this course. <clears throat> well, what this d means is it means that there's a rate of change with respect to something. So in this case, the rate of change of the momentum with respect to the rate of change of time. And in this case, the force is proportional to that change. Right? You're applying a force. You're changing the momentum of the object that you're acting upon. The third law just simply says that the sum of those momentums must be conserved, right? And this turns out to be a really, really important concept because, you know, some, somebody emailed me about uh, the planets, the spinning motion of the planets, you know, and is the Earth ever going to stop spinning and so forth, which is a pretty cool question. 
Uh, and the answer is maybe, <clears throat> but if it does, somebody else is going to have to start spinning. Or the Earth's going to have to lose some part of itself which goes off and takes that momentum. Because there's a lot of material in motion, in a rotational motion, and you can't just stop that without somebody else taking all of that effort up. Okay. You know, I'm going to save the general relativity for another day. I think your, your textbook will get into it. I think it's better to do that instead of getting lost in it right now. I want to talk about this idea, though, because this, will, this is very important to, uh, to orbits and to the actual uh, layout of the solar system that we have today. And this is this concept that uh, not only does momentum, momentum can be angular, right? You can talk about a motion that's changing its velocity, and I, I don't mean that it's changing speed, it's just changing the angle at which it's traveling. And one way to affect that is to either, like I said, cut off a piece uh, of the thing that's rotating, that will change the angular momentum, but you can also just rearrange the components of it. So figure skaters make use of this all the time. If they bring their arms in while they're spinning, they'll spin faster. And this is, this is interesting because angular momentum depends on the size of the object, but it also depends on the mass of the object. And so angular momentum can't change. There's, there's no way where for that motion, that energy to go, it can't be dissipated. And so what happens? <clears throat> well, the speed has to increase to complement the change in the radius. It's a conserved quantity. And, and these, this idea of conservation is, becomes, at this point in the story, begins to, to, to dominate the, the, the landscape. This, this idea that equal and, and opposite forces, there's, there's always some way to keep track of motion as it dissipates throughout the solar system. So this is going to really start to matter when we talk about the layout of the planets, which I believe we're going to get into next week. Uh, you see this with rocket ships, right? This, this conservation of momentum. When the explosive propellants fire out the back of a rocket ship, they're, they're putting a lot of pressure, they're pushing on the Earth, and the Earth has to push back against them with the equal magnitude, right? And this is, this might seem common sense, but it's an interesting schematization of the concept of push and pull, and this idea that things must be balanced, which is really fascinating because it takes us back to our, our indigenous cosmology to some extent from last week, right? This idea of balance is so important in the universe. You can't just have things bleeding away. You don't just lose energy, and, and this is, this, is a, this wasn't really formalized until the 20th century, or 19th century, when people started working on engines. But energy is energy, material in motion, it, it never disappears. And of course, this is, it never appears either in a closed system, anyways. And this is a nightmare for the cosmologists today, right? Because they're trying to construct a birth of the universe, and that's very difficult to achieve if energy is never created or destroyed, but it really doesn't seem to be. In fact, it's very difficult for us to rationalize how something could start moving without something moving it. And that's really at the heart of these principles. If, if you want to get something going, you're going to have to put a lot of effort into it. And this seems to be true, and I think it was true to the, to the most distant ancestors that we have. I mean, it's true on a fundamental level. If you want to get something done in your life, you've got to work really hard at it. It's an unfortunate truth to realize. You know, which is, which is why college is such an amazing time, because you have this moment where maybe you don't have to w work in, in the capacity of earning money so much as, as you might a uh, few years from now. I'm sure many of you... ...actually sit back and explore and understand the universe. But to do something requires effort, and it's a proportional effort to do what you want to do to that outcome. Oh, and of course, Newton gave us the concept of mass, too. Now, mass is, is something that you probably think you know what it means. And certainly, the textbook asserts that it knows what it means. 
But I think that it's not so simple, especially when you start studying fundamental physics, when you start studying electromagnetism, when you start studying little things like quarks, like the subatomic structure. Mass becomes a little bizarre. So when Newton talked about mass, what did he mean? Well, he meant how much material was gravitationally available, right? And <clears throat> I would assert that that is probably the only robust definition of mass. Now, the way that it's gotten confused with the amount of material total is an interesting story. Uh, it's kind of beyond the scope of this course. Maybe we'll get into it a little bit. But when people started playing with electricity in like the 18th, 19th century, really, they, and particularly J.J. Thompson and the discovery of the electron, they noticed that the deflection of these beams, which they thought were beams of electrons, and most people still think of it this way today, although there's problems with that, but the deflection of these beams could be counterbalanced with a mass, a gravitational mass. And so they said things like these subatomic particles had mass also, right? Because there was an equivalent. And in fact, if you measure things at the subatomic level today, you measure them in electron volts, right? Because the, we're actually measuring the deflection of that signal in an electronic context. And it does have an equivalent. And so people have assigned mass to these subatomic elements, but there's problems with that. There's, there's serious problems with that, actually. So Newton gave us the idea that mass is equivalent to matter. And I would also say that matter is probably not an appropriate thing to assign to anything other than something made out of atoms as well because of this. Because it seems like gravity depends on atoms. This is maybe something that your textbook won't mention. But this is really fascinating. <clears throat> You know, they haven't been able to make sense of gravity at a subatomic level yet, right? We can understand very precisely how gravity works. Newton's equations are brilliant, very simple. We'll talk about them in a second. Einstein improved upon it a little bit, a little bit more precise, but they don't translate down below the atom. The stuff below the size of the atom doesn't seem to care about gravity at all. And I, I don't mean like, Gravity is weak down there. I mean, it just doesn't matter at all. There's no translation of that concept. And that's why I say I'm troubled by the concept of mass being applied to things that are too small, right? And the same idea of matter being applied to things that are too small. So I like to use the word material for things that are made out of, out of objects that have surfaces, which is distinct from matter, which is stuff made out of atoms. OK. What else can we say? Density. This is easy. This is just the, the amount of mass in a given volume. Uh, maybe if we want to go subatomic, we're going to have to say the amount of material that's in a given volume. Of course, the volume is just a geometric description, length, height, width. It's a box. Right? So how much stuff is in there? How dense is, is it packed? OK. so. We come back to the beginning points of this mathematical discussion. And Newton had this revelation that, hey, Kepler had a fantastic idea with this relationship between the radius of the orbit, or we'll say the semi-major axis of the ellipse and the period. But I think there's something more to this. I think that the scale of that depends upon the mass, how much stuff is there, how many atoms are in those planets. And this, this, is really, this is really quite brilliant. So Newton was able to do away with our proportionality sign and actually give us an equal sign. And this was just mind-numbing to people at the time. So Newton formalized it into this equation, where he said the force, the push or the pull of gravity. He, he actually went so far as to say, hey, the reason these planets are orbiting is because they're being pulled by the sun. And that, that was a revolutionary concept at the time. What do you mean they're being pulled by the sun? Right? Well, yeah, they're being pulled by the sun. The thing is that they're flying really fast, 
you know, and they want to go off in their own direction, but they're being pulled at a perfect balance. You know, somebody emailed me and said, why don't the planets, are they ever going to fall into the sun? Uh, let's hope not, but here's the thing, maybe, you know, but what would it take for a planet to fall into the sun? That balance has to be upset. The forward versus the inward pull is going to have to be upset. How does that happen? Well, the planet's going to have to lose a big piece of itself, perhaps, or it's going to have to get whacked by another planet or something terrible, right? Some, something completely unpredictable, something beyond the scope. Uh, you look worried. Don't worry. It's not going to happen. <laughs> I mean, I doubt it's going to happen today anyways, right? Uh, there, and there's some evidence this has happened in the past. You know, there, one of the prevailing theories about the origin of the moon is that it was a planet that smacked into the Earth, and they exchanged, you know, bits of each other, and uh, eventually the moon formed up. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. I, I have some doubts myself. But this seems to be a, a, an idea of things that can happen. In fact, we talked a little bit in the first class. At the very end, we talked about the Oort cloud, which is this... this very, very distant body, a uh, uh, collection of bodies uh, at the edge of the solar system, you know, almost halfway to the next, next star system, right? And we can imagine these Oort clouds of different star systems kind of grinding into each other like gears. But the Oort cloud may have been populated with planetary bodies at some point. It might still have planets out there, and there's some evidence that perhaps they can periodically get knocked into the interior and cause all sorts of great havoc. <clears throat> Now, if that has happened, it's probably only happened once in the entire uh, history of life on the planet or something like that. It's very, very rare, and the, the evidence is scant. So, Newton's famous law. Now, what does this mean? I want you to really think about what does this mean. It means that the gravitational force varies with the square, the inverse square of the distance. Now, I came across, I, I, I spend a tremendous amount of time in my life thinking about why this is the case. Why is there an inverse square law of, gra of gravity? <clears throat> and at some point I came across this scholar. This was a, a Persian scholar named uh, Jarir Artabiri. Goodness. And Tabiri had this idea that, that everything was connected by cords. All of the atoms were connected to one another. And, and I think this makes a bit of sense. I'm not saying it is so. I'm saying that it's maybe a good way to think about the effect of gravity dis dissipating at a distance. So if you can think about this sheet of paper, the first one that says A, is having four cords attached to it. If you go out a distance of 2R, you're going to need four different sheets of paper. In other words, each sheet of paper is only going to have a quarter. That's 1 over 2 squared, the inverse square of attachment points to the Earth. If you go out three, you're going to have a ninth of the connections. This is the inverse square law. I think it's the best way to think about it. And in fact, this plays out with light as well, which is a really fascinating corollary, which I am absolutely certain will be instrumental in updating our understanding of gravitation and light, because light behaves exactly the same way. Now, light is a little bit easier to understand because you have rays of light. Everybody thinks of light as rays. People don't generally think about gravity as rays. But it might not be inappropriate to start thinking about gravity as rays, actually. And this is outside the scope of the textbook, but it's something to think about. So light behaves exactly the same way. The intensity of light decreases with a square of the distance, just like this. And uh, there might be some insight there. It's something to go home and think about anyways. I should have probably showed this, this object a few minutes ago, or this, this drawing a few minutes ago. But this gives you some idea of the balance of forces, right? These, these, there's, a, there's this very beautiful, perfect balance. The, these orbits, what is an orbit? It's a perfect balance between the object falling into the sun and the object flying off into space, right? And it's, it's not entirely clear it's not clear to us, anyways, how perfect that balance is, actually, because it seems extraordinarily stable. And of course, the, the planets <clears throat> interact with one another. They, there's gravitational interactions, especially with the larger ones. And so the whole system is stabilized. And we can think about the whole system being stabilized, perhaps in a Machian sense, too, from the inertia 
of all of it. These things that are in motion want to stay in motion. And perhaps that matters. And so this is how you need to begin to think about orbital dynamics. It's, it's a balance of falling and forward motion. And again, falling is not an easy idea, right? This, is, this comes back to, to why do objects fall? Beyond the scope of this course, but this is a huge open topic, you know? Somebody mentioned general relativity has done a great job of providing us a very accurate depiction of how things fall. And, and that's true. It's incredible. And, and, and I, I, I think this was a, a very uh, brilliant revelation. But it doesn't tell us why they fall, right? And maybe you've had some people tell you, like, oh, okay, well, it's, the space-time is curved or something. But space-time is a mathematical concept, right? It just means the way things move in time. And to say that the way things move in time is warped is a little bit of a cop-out. It's not actually a mechanism for how it happens. I don't mean to say that it's not useful. It's very useful. And of course, making those mathematical models like, Koper like Kepler did allow us to gain insight later into what actually causes them. The gravitation's just a wonderful open topic, you know? If you want to get involved in, in physics someday, you know, maybe you'll just have some insight. But we don't totally understand why objects fall. This is wonderful, actually. And, and people, by the way, will tell you that we do. But, but what they're really saying is we can describe to you how they fall. We can very articulately draw out for you with quantitative certainty exactly how they fall depending on their, their mass and their distances and all these things. That doesn't mean they understand what causes them to mechanistically, right? So this is a wonderful open page. In, in the world of physics, uh, gravitation, and to some extent, the behavior of light. All right. Newton also uh, had this idea that, uh, you know, if you were able to somehow throw an object fast enough that maybe it could leave the, it could leave the planet and find itself with that proportional that perfect balance of forward motion and downward fall. And it turns out that, yes, yeah, yeah, you can do that. You can do that, actually. Uh, and we do that. That's how we put satellites in space all the time. We essentially throw the object really, really hard up at the sky. Now, if you throw them, if you throw them fast enough, they can actually leave the orbit. And that turns out to be really, really fast. And what's really interesting about this concept, it's called escape velocity, what it takes to, how much speed it takes for an object to leave uh, an orbit. It turns out to have nothing to do with how big that object is. It's entirely dependent on the characteristics of the body that it's trying to escape. And so it varies uh, with the square root uh, of the mass. And the mass of the body, like say the Earth, if you're trying to get a spaceship outside of it, it only depends on, on the mass of the Earth. G is a gravitational constant. This was also, uh, we talked a little bit about constants today, and there was, a <clears throat> there was a constant in Newton's equation as well. Let's just go check that out really quick. You see this G, this big G. This is a universal gravitation constant. Now, what's fascinating about constants? We already talked about this. What is, what's up with constants? Well, scaling factors mean something, right? What does big G mean? We don't know, actually. It's just a number that appears to be able to scale gravitation. And, and it has a very compound unit set, right? It's, very, it's, it's a very important number, and we're not sure what it means, but it can actually lead us maybe to understand the mechanism of gravitation at some point. I think that there's some clues embedded in there, just like there were clues embedded in, in Kepler's uh, equivalence, right? <clears throat> Which Newton came back and said, OK, that's actually the mass of the planets that fit in there. There's something like that going on with big G. And so we see that in terms of escape velocity. So escape velocity is really fast for the Earth, right? How fast do you think you have to go to escape the Earth's uh, gravity? Anybody? Yes? OK, you read it. Yeah, it's 25,000 uh, miles per hour. I believe it's miles per hour. Is it kilometers per hour? Yeah, it's miles per hour. That's very fast. but. It doesn't matter, it's the same for everything, uh, at least in, on, in Earth's orbit. And so we actually can make use of this. Um, you can actually 
with a spacecraft, say you're trying to find your way out to one of the, the far off planets like Jupiter or Saturn, well, it takes a great deal of fuel to pull that off. And so what you can do is you can take advantage of the fact that the planets will sort of pull you along as they go. And you can hop, as you can see here, forward a little bit. You use a little bit of that forward momentum of the planet. And of course, <clears throat> you're going to slow the planet down a little bit. Hopefully it works out. But you're going to slow it down just a tiny bit. Remember, the, the momentum is always conserved. You can, it, by pulling on that spaceship, the planet gives it some of its forward velocity, but it loses a little bit too. It's such a little bit that it's just completely insignificant. So this is a really useful principle. You know, one of the things that I, I love to point out is that NASA uses Newton's equations, right? We have, we have general relativity, which is much more precise. They don't care. It doesn't matter. In 99.9% .9 of cases, general relativity doesn't matter. There's cases where you want to have a really precise measurement, right? I think um, especially clocks, atomic clocks, you want to have, uh, you need to apply relativity to actually get it very precise. But for things like this, they're just using Newtonian equations. This is incredible. This is just a basic idea that's hundreds and hundreds of years old. All right, so it turns out that when you <clears throat> start to calculate the orbital dynamics for more than one body, it gets really ugly. And I'm not going to do this math to you right now. But this is just three bodies. We've been talking about two this entire time. Two is relatively simple, but when you bring three bodies into it, chaos ensues. The tiniest little variation in one body can throw the entire system off. <clears throat> in fact, this, uh, this is a set of uh, uh, differential equations that has no generalized solution. You can't actually solve it and say this is the definitive answer for it. It might, might be a little bit different every time. That's fascinating. So the three body problem is something of a, like a pool trick amongst mathematicians. They play with this. Um, they'll try, uh, there, there's also, you try, imagine bringing a fourth body into it, right? Now, that doesn't mean that we can't make any statements about three or four bodies. And the story that I want to close with uh, is about finding planets that we didn't know were there, that we can't see. So, this is a, a lovely picture of Neptune. Now, this is, I believe, in the infrared spectrum. This is, just came back from the James Webb. Very beautiful planet. Has a number of moons, and has some rings to it. But you can't really see it from Earth, is the thing. And we got some pictures of it with the Hubble recently. But for many, many years, uh, didn't know it was there. However, people were playing with this idea that, OK, uh, Newton's equations are great, but if they are so, then these orbits should be perturbed a little bit by one another. And so the mathematicians at the academy were going through the books, and they were checking the orbits. And, and, and they looked at the biggest, easiest ones to observe first. You know, uh, Jupiter, obviously, uh, Mars, Mercury, Venus. And they were able to show that, or they were, they were able to discern some multi-body dynamics amongst them. The orbits were actually a little bit affected by one another. And so this was great. However, when they started to look uh, beyond Jupiter at Uranus, they found that Uranus didn't really match up with the expected multi-body dynamics. Its orbit was off a little bit. They couldn't correct it no matter what they did. And this was bad. Actually, Newton's formula was on the ropes at that point. People were like, I don't know, maybe the guy's, maybe he's wrong. And independently, on two different parts of the continent, these two gentlemen, let me not mess up their names to do them some service, Adams and Verrier, uh, they both came up with the idea that and they calculated exactly where it should be that, hey, 
I think that there could be another planet that's out there that's causing this orbit to be slightly flattened in this particular portion at this time of the year. And they said, they wrote to all of the different astronomers at the time who were different people. And this is actually an interesting theme, by the way. It seems like the people who look at the stars are, are different than the people who are coming up with the theories about them, which is a, a fascinating concept. It's not so much the same today. And maybe that's not a good thing, actually. Because if you're the one doing the observations about your, your, your own theory, you, you're probably going to have some incentive to make the observations line up to your theory. At any rate, these guys pointed to a, a place in the sky and they said, if you go and look over there on this day, you're going to see a planet. And they were right. And I think this is a, a remarkable story, again, of how once we understand a law that seems to be universal, like gravitation, if we accept that gravitation is the cause of the, body, the motion of these bodies, then there must be something we can see. There was a dark planet there that was causing it, right? You couldn't see it. Now, it turns out, actually, Neptune's not dark. It actually gives off two times the light that it gets from the sun. That's really fascinating if you want to think about it. In fact, once we get into planets and stars, you're going to start seeing that with some planets, the line between planet and star is very blurry, actually. And that's, that's something that we'll get into. But that dark planet made its appearance. And once they really trained their, their telescopes to the right part of the sky, they were able to see it. So all of these dark things that we see when we look at the sky, there is some explanation for them. It's waiting for people like you. Maybe a few of you will go into astronomy. Maybe someone's going to make sense of what's actually happening. Every single time, look for that. When you, when you see headlines, look for the words dark or black or mysterious, right? These are the questions that need solved. And we'll do it. You will do it. Let's, uh, let's stop for today. Thank you, guys.